Hi everyone. Uh, we now have a discussion on scaling EV usage with virtual fleets. Uh, the moderator for this session is Philip Huismans, VP of Growth at RideCell. Uh, then we have Ian Macbeth, Director of Electric Vehicle Strategy um, at a Enterprise Holdings. And then we have Johan Lundblad, uh, Head of Kinto Nordics and Baltics at uh, Toyota Group. And then we have Adrian Canarian, uh, Head of Mot Mobility Partnerships and Energy Transition at Arvold BNP Paribus Group. Hello, everyone. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us. And um, I think today's panel is a, a wonderful example of what's going on in the world today. I'm sure if you look around at the, at the conference, you'll notice that maybe half the panel sessions have the, the two letters EV in them. And that's for, because there's been a, um, a huge, I'd say, inflection point in the market. I, I would place it around 2018, 2019, when we went to the Frankfurt uh, Auto Show. All of a sudden, in 2019, we saw the world had turned to EV. Um, having said that, you know, EVs, you know, still have you know many challenges ahead. If you looked at penetration across markets, oftentimes the total uh, EV pool is no more than five percent of the vehicles. And oftentimes we've said it's charging infrastructure has been the, uh, the, the main reason for uh, range anxiety for people to basically buy an EV versus a, a regular ICE vehicle. And so for, for us, uh, I'm Philippe Heismans and I'm um, uh, EVP of growth at Ridesell. And Ridesell, what we do is we digitize fleets. So we've had the, uh, the honor and privilege of working and, and launching some of the largest electric fleets uh, in Asia, in, in the Americas, and in Europe, uh, because we worked on shared fleets. And so we f fundamentally believe that fleets are the accelerated path and leading the charge uh, towards electrification and uh, net zero. And so we, what we wanted to obviously bring today to today's panel is three unique perspectives from three of the industry leaders in different fields. So uh, to, to my left, I have Johan, uh, who, who represents Kinto, head of uh, Nordics and Baltics, uh, as an OEM perspective. I'll quickly introduce them and then, and then more in depth. Uh, Andrian is, represents uh, the leasing world, and Ian uh, represents the car rental world. And if you look at their respective companies, they're actually the leading companies in each of those segments. You know, Johan, part of the Toyota Group and Kinto Initiative, the, the forward-looking brand for shared mobility and uh, new mobility. Um, Andrian um, sort of is, is head of uh, energy transition at Arval BNP, you know, the, the largest uh, leasing group uh, worldwide. And uh, Ian is um, also Head, head of the, the, the transition and, and, and innovation at um, Enterprise Holdings, which is the largest uh, car rental company in the world. So these three unique perspectives um, will, will be very interesting. And so maybe uh, having said that, I, I can uh, ask you, Johan, if maybe if you, if you can pick up the mic and uh, inter introduce yourself. So I said, Johan, head of Kinto. Kinto, just so you know, is a new brand by the uh, Toyota Group that basically manages uh, their their new mobility, which is basically um, uh, it, it can go from a, a car sharing to subscriptions to ride share. There's multiple uh, verticals within Kinto, and Yoan heads up um, you know one of the most successful, if not the most successful, operation uh, you know worldwide has launched uh, w within very little time, actually during COVID times a uh, operation of Kinto in the Nordics, and it's been uh, very successful. And so leading the charge in shared mobility, and we'll talk about you know, electric mobility today as well. Delighted to be here in this panel and uh, visiting the MOVE conference. So to add a little bit on, on what Kinto is and what we're doing is, uh, 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 to put it very shortly, there's a twofold mission that we have within the Toyota Group as Kinto when it was established. It was on one hand side, transform how Toyota and Lexus products go into the market. So meaning we are going from an ownership model to a usership model and putting the products into a service model where we are recycling them in different kind of user segments. 
So inherently, we see this as a kind of circular business model where we keep the assets and we put them in different kind of uh, customer segments, whether that is in a corporate sector or in a consumer world, we don't differentiate that. We keep, we really build on how we can make the most out of the assets that is very resource intensive and how they can actually be used to create more mobility as a whole. The second mission that we're on when we launched Kinta was also to address the new, emerging new mobility needs in society, especially looking to the cities and, and uh, what, when we look around here, we, talk, we see a lot of good examples of how micro-mobility has become part of the norm. And we really embrace that and see that that's part of our future in delivering new mobility services. Uh, micro-mobility and many different forms that we are not maybe used to today will be part of our future delivered as a service. So that's uh, a, a very big move from the traditional automotive company. And that's the decision to put a, create another brand, a global brand, that is, is not directly linked to the Toyota and Lexus customer promise, but it's a service delivered. Uh, and I'm heading up the initiative in the Nordic and Baltic region. And as Philip said, we, we focused on launching station-based car sharing. And today we operate uh, more than 1,000 units in Sweden and Denmark in, in a station-based uh, model in, in central location in the, the key cities in this region. Yeah, so thank you, thanks uh, for adding to that, uh, Johan. So, uh, Andrian, uh, you know, re represents a head of um, energy transition at Arval BNP Paribas uh, and across Europe. So, we'll bring a unique perspective. Yeah, add to that introduction. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks, Philippe. So, hi everyone, happy to be here. So, I'm part of Arval. For those who do not know Arval, so we are a leasing company. Uh, we've been around for over 30 years. So, historically, uh, basically, we were concentrating on corporate customers, so uh, leasing vehicles, so financing vehicles and all the services around vehicles for corporate customers. Recently, we have uh, well developed to other segments, including B2C. Um, and more importantly, we are migrating towards a mobility company. So we want to be able to address the various mobility needs uh, of our customers. So be it a company car, but also uh, other forms of mobility. And what we see uh, when it comes to cars, we see that the mobility is uh, expected to be much more sustainable and, uh, and cars ultimately uh, electric as much as possible. And as you said, uh, so uh, in the last couple of months, we've seen a lot of traction and a lot of interest from uh, customers, not only to test electric vehicles, but really to make the right step towards electrifying their fleets. Uh. And indeed, I'm, I'm heading the uh, uh, energy transition uh, part, so uh, happy to be part of, of this discussion now. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, I'm glad so many people have managed to track themselves away from lunch, so it's nice to see a full, full room. Uh, so my name's Ian McBeth. Um, I'm EV Strategy Director uh, for Europe uh, for Enterprise Holdings. Um, Maybe some of you don't know who Enterprise Holdings are. Um, sometimes we get accused of being a software group or something like that. Um, but we're the largest global shared mobility uh, fleet. Uh, established in 1957 in uh, St. Louis in Missouri and been in Europe for over 30 years now. Um, again, the largest uh, car rental operation in the UK. Um, and I'm basically in charge of the transition towards electric vehicles whether that's meeting the UK government uh, objectives of 2030 or the European Commission directives around 2035. Um, which sounds a little way away, but then when you say it's only seven or eight years ago that we're going to have a fully EV fleet uh, in the UK, that does set some challenges and expectations. So we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail and maybe contrast where we are different from a Leaseco or an OEM um, going forward. All right. And, and so maybe to, to open up with, so, th so those are the introductions, as you can tell, um, you know, the three different industries looking at it, uh, it, you know, from their own perspective and also the industry leaders in, in each of them. Uh, Ian, maybe uh, you can start with some of the current initiatives and, and, and maybe also if you have specific company targets uh, around, uh, you know, EVs and, and net zero. We've got a fleet of around about 125,000 vehicles in the UK alone. Globally, that fleet is roughly 2 million. So we are the largest buyer of vehicles uh, in the world. 
Um, and of course, that challenge to electrify it, or certainly to, to transition that to, to zero emission, um, it is quite significant for a company of our scale. We know very well how to rent ICE vehicles. EVs are a little bit more of a challenge, particularly around the charging infrastructure side of things. And that, that, that is probably the biggest challenge. I think the previous panel mentioned that as well. Uh, we can buy the vehicles, we will invest in the vehicles, but it's the customer experience that's a key part of that. And I think one of the main differences between a rental, and, and Andrew and will talk about lease cars, is a TCO. Um, we only keep the vehicles for six to nine months on average. So the turnaround of that fleet is, 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 is massive. Um, and you can imagine sort of buying and tr uh, remarketing that number of vehicles is phenomenal. Now, we've got current challenges in the supply chain, uh, as you might imagine, uh, along with everybody else. But really, that's actually ironic because it just gives the charging infrastructure a little bit of time to catch up with the supply of vehicles. And, and what we've been seeing and, and talking with governments, both with the European Commission and here in the UK, is really how can we sort of increase that rollout of public charging infrastructure? Because our customers don't charge at home typically. Uh, you don't rent a car to put it on your driveway. You have it in your office. You're going on a business trip. You're on holiday. Or it's an accident replacement vehicle. All of those scenarios are not places where you charge at home. And you may not have charging infrastructure, certainly at this moment in time. Nor do you rent a vehicle to spend six or seven hours on a, an AC level two charger. You want to be almost replicating the forecourt experience with an ICE vehicle today. So that starts to sort of give you an idea of the, the, the challenges we have. Utilization rate of our fleet is around about 90%. So it doesn't mean 90% of our vehicles are on the road at any one time but they're out on rental earning revenue. And the turnaround times are typically, one in four of our vehicles gets turned around within an hour, between return by one customer and going out to another. If you know anything about EV charging, an hour to get the vehicle charged up and not knowing at this moment in time what state of charge is coming back to you, it is a challenge. If you're in an airport during busy summer season, that can be 15 or 20 minutes. So you begin to see the realize that we need rapid charging infrastructure, our customers want that when they're out and about using the vehicles. And so that's a bit of a challenge. The second thing is that we don't actually build petrol stations ourselves. We use third party infrastructure in the majority of our refueling cases. With the challenges of EV and electrification, we're having to electrify our branches. And just in the UK alone, we've got 470 locations, uh, which uh, we're having to electrify. Now, historically, we're just used to keeping the lights on, keeping the computers running when you're talking about rapid charging of several hundred vehicles at a branch location, you start to run into the utilities, the power grids, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot going on. Now, in terms of targets, our targets are set by our customers. We will provide and deliver and support our customers in whatever they need. And so if they need a special use vehicle, we'll find that for them. If we find a standard BEV solution, we'll do that. And in some cases, increasing with commercial vehicles, it could be hydrogen. So what we are doing is just navigating what our customers want. If you're seeing where demand is coming from at the moment, it's some of the larger corporates from an ESG perspective, um, particularly the sort of large multinationals who've made those ESG commitments and are pushing that down their supply chain. And they're willing to pay a little bit more for those EVs. Second area is insurance replacement here in the UK in particular, 0% benefit in kind on company cars. It's led to a lot of wide scale adoption in that area. But of course, even company cars have bumps and accidents and so we provide a lot of the replacement vehicles for the insurance sector and the expectations for like for like on that so again that's something where we're seeing seeing quite a lot of activity that was great it, it was um because you added a lot of uh, challenges because uh, i'll have a question later on on challenges as well so let's see if, if you can top that but um so I, just just going uh, on, on back on like right now what what are the the targets that you have and some of the current initiatives that you're running um, in, at uh, Arval? Basically, we set two major targets. Um, we want to help our customers in this uh, energy transition uh, journey. And we want to be the leading player in our industry when it comes to electrification and everything around electric vehicle. What does it mean in terms of numbers? Because we wanted this to be uh, tangible. 
um, basically we want to reach uh, a certain number of electrified vehicles. Um, initially, we, we wanted to reach 25% of our fleet that would be uh, electrified by the horizon 2025, and that equates to 500,000 electrified vehicles. And in fact, uh, earlier this year, we, we revised that uh, the target to 700,000 because uh, we see that uh, the market uh, is there. So there is a lot of traction. Uh, and in fact, all the, some of the initiatives that we have started to put in place, uh, well, they, they are uh, successful. And, uh, and we believe that we can reach this new um, uh, threshold. So, yeah. I, I, so so, so I'm, I'm just going to interrupt for a second because that's an incredible example of a target that moved like within two years, maybe I could even say an uh, extended year, from 25% of the massive fleet of Arval, of two million vehicles, now it's now 35% already a year later. So, you know, next year it'll be 45, et cetera. So it, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, and, and the funny thing, yesterday we were in a senior management meeting and uh, uh, one of the people in the meeting so realized that we were already meeting that target, so that revised target, so uh, maybe we'll have to revise it uh, down the road. I don't know. Uh, so, but uh, I, I think that it proves that the market is indeed moving into that direction and, uh, and we need to make sure that we help our customers in that journey because this is what they expect from us. Huh? So uh, there are challenges, as you were saying, uh, so uh, the charging uh, piece is, uh, is clearly one of them. Uh, the, the TCO, which is not necessarily, uh, we, we have not reached uh, the, this TCO parity everywhere yet. So we'll discuss about those, but uh, yeah, clear targets about it. So we want to be a leading player when it comes to it and uh, yeah, some high ambitions in terms of figures. Huh? Incredible. So, so really like two of the largest organizations, uh, you know, deep into uh, advancing and uh, EV adoption, uh, Johan. And, and so maybe to preface, Toyota has a unique, or Kinto, I should say, has a unique perspective because they play towards net zero both on the EV and the hydrogen side. So you feel free to bring in hydrogen as well. Because we are much uh, younger in our managed fleet setup in the Nordics than you are, having operated for decades. We... Uh, we started in 2020 during the pandemic. We went 100% hybrid, fully hybrid electric. And that is in line with, Toyota has pursued a different approach with multi drivetrain technologies, which includes hybrid, plug-in hybrid, battery electric vehicle, and the fourth being hydrogen. This is our approach to really uh, reach carbon neutrality and really find ways to give uh, decarbonize and really give more options to consumers around the globe because we live in a very diverse uh, world. We have very diverse circumstances that calls for uh, diverse solutions. So that's why we're working on this multi-technology approach. And we have brought that into Kinto as well. So when we are looking at the user needs, the hybrid vehicle is very good. It's, uh, it's much more efficient and it takes away the the issue with actually charging infrastructure, and even though I'm from the region in the world where we have the highest EV penetration, like Norway, we still have challenges when it comes to recharging a vehicle so that it can be quickly handed over to another customer that should use it. Because we operate in car sharing, everything is about keeping the vehicle available for the next customer. So the hybrid vehicle for us was a great way to quickly electrify the whole fleet and really learn from how the customers responded to that. The next step for us was to introduce plug-in hybrids because as we saw how the customers were using our cars, we saw they were not traveling that far. In average, they are doing 70 kilometers. And we, we look at the whole year and we see that the 70 kilometers can actually be met with a plug-in hybrid that we have. So they could go fully electric, but still have the option if they travel longer that they have the uh, combustion engine, the hybrid system that can take over. But in reality, we see these vehicles that we operate now basically doing fully electric journeys and then giving the comfort to the customer that they know they can pick up this vehicle uh, and, and really use it fully electric, but they can always travel this longer distance. Uh, now we are in the phase of introducing our new electric vehicles globally. So Toyota is now starting to ship their first fully electric vehicles that are built on a new global uh, electric vehicle platform. And we are excited to bring these vehicles into our fleet as well. And we will learn a lot from operating with 
fully battery electric vehicle. But we think uh, when we look at how the customers are behaving, that this kind of mix of different drivetrain is actually really useful for us. And, and, and that's what we're going to continue to work with. We're, we're committed to have that. But uh, we have to recognize that the cities in Europe may have different views on combustion engines and hybrid systems. So we are, of course, as a managed fleet, we are ready to uh, quickly transform to fully electric if that's what the cities will require from us. Uh, on a last note then, to just comment on hydrogen. Hydrogen is, is an electrification of a vehicle, but it's using hydrogen uh, to produce electricity through a fuel cell. So it, hydrogen vehicles are electric vehicles and they reuse a lot of the components that we have built in hybrid vehicles. So we think uh, we're one of few that is investing heavily in this, in the passenger car segment, but we believe that in the future, hydrogen will be important to solve carbon neutrality. And even though now we talk a lot about trucks and, and, and commercial vehicles, we think it will be relevant in passenger cars as well in the future. So we think that could be part of solving the zero emission vehicles in the city in combination with battery electric vehicles. So uh, currently today we operate t almost 10 uh, next new generation fuel cell vehicles in, in two different cities in Sweden. And uh, it, it's really great to kind of democratize this technology. It is very difficult to get out there, but with car sharing, we're able to reach uh, so many customers and, and, and companies that really want to try this technology and, and they really want to see that becoming uh, a reality in the future. So car sharing has enabled us to democratize uh, hydrogen uh, in, in many different customer segments. Thank you, Johan. Again, super interesting perspective. Maybe if you uh, give the microphone back to Ian, um, let, let's, let's, let's uh, think about like what's driving, because it's, it's now we just heard about all the initiatives underway, uh, some of the objectives of, of the different uh, groups uh, towards uh, net zero and uh, EVs. Uh, but what's driving fundamentally uh, the changes? And, and hearing, from me, hearing from each of your perspectives, you know, will be a, a different lens uh, on, on you know, what's, what's pushing you forward, or it's self-motivation, I don't know. Certainly, certainly from our perspective, this has been driven by government, very top level. And if you want to go beyond that, from the European Commission in Europe, so a lot of it is government-led, but then being devolved down to different local authorities, administrations, city administrations, which is where you start to see low emission zones, ultra low emission zones, access controls, all of that kind of things. And of course that drives behaviors of our customers. Uh, so our customers either are directly impacted financially by having to pay ultra low emission zone charges, um, or they're coming from, as I mentioned earlier, ESG strategies from the larger companies who then want their supply chain to also contribute to that ESG strategy. So, so fundamentally, it is government initiatives that have really driven it. Uh, the OEMs are now really stepping up the, the, the availability of cars, notwithstanding supply shortage. And we're beginning to see some of that democratization of availability by type of model. Um, Typically, a rental vehicle is in the band A to D vehicles category, so that they're smaller or cheaper vehicles. And historically, the early generation of EVs were quite expensive uh, premium product. So you're beginning to see the democratization of vehicle model into the EV world as well. And that enables a lot of companies to then sort of drive forward because of the cost, um, particularly on that. Uh, Andrian mentioned TCOs. Uh, TCO is quite different in a rental company to a, to a lease co. Yes, we do provide lead-in vehicles to, to the lease companies and, and that kind of thing. But as I mentioned, we only keep our vehicles for six to nine months. So we don't see the fuel savings that a, a, a lease co driver, a company car driver would see. Nor do we see the maintenance benefits uh, from that as well. So what that kind of gives you an indication is, yes, it's coming from government, Yes, it's coming from multinationals and trickling down through that. But fundamentally, there's a cost imperative in there as well. And so the, the sooner that we see price parity with the EVs and the ICE vehicles, the more that will change. And from our perspective, we expect that pricing differential to equalize around about 2025, maybe 2026, given current events. But that's the point when electric vehicles start to be cheaper 
uh, to buy the Nanai's vehicle. And two reasons for that is the battery manufacturing capacity in Europe coming on stream. Some of the uh, battery uh, passport that the Commission is looking into and fundamentally Euro 7 that will make ICE vehicles more expensive. So these are the sort of factors that are going on behind our customers' thinking. So yeah, no, very very interesting uh, sort of market forces. What, what about you, uh, Andrian? I would like to switch the question a little bit around and uh, think about the customers uh, and, and try to see uh, the reasons why customers choose electric vehicles. Huh? Because I, I fully agree huh, with what drives the, this uh, electrification. But, if we think about the customers and if we start with early adopters and then moving into 2022, I would say there are sort of four categories of customers huh? and, and four reasons that drive uh, uh, this electrification in their fleet. The first category would be uh, the customers that have an activity that is related to, to this industry. So think about energy utility companies, think about companies that uh, produce charging infrastructure and, and so on. So they want to start electrifying uh, their fleets and, and show the example. Huh? And, and we've seen this in the past years. The second ca category uh, are companies basically that have a very strong CSR commitment. And in some cases they are ready to pay a premium because they have CSR con convictions and they know that you know, they, it needs to be reflected in their fleet strategy. The third category that I would think of is companies that have a business that needs to keep on running as, and is dependent on this mobility, on the car. Think about companies that have activities in cities. So we have a lot of elevator companies that, as our customers. We have uh, companies uh, that uh, deliver goods in the uh, cent uh, city centers. And basically they t tell us, well guys, if in a couple of years time I cannot access London, I cannot access Paris, I ho I'm in trouble. Huh? So even if it costs 10% more, I need to be able to operate uh, my activities. And lastly, the most important one, so remember the four categories, is indeed the TCO. And in fact, we see now uh, markets where the TCO is more competitive. So either the TCO or uh, the benefiting kind. So basically you have this uh, cost uh, parameter that makes driving an electric vehicle cheaper. And, and ultimately this, this will be the one, you know, uh, the main reason that will help with this uh, massive electrification and adoption of electric vehicles. Because today indeed the, um, what the governments are doing and, and the public authorities still play a key role in, in making EVs successful. And this is why we see a, a big discrepancy between the countries. So countries with much higher EV adoption rather than others, because it's still related to these incentives in place. Huh? And when we think about these um, reasons for our customers, our role is to help them. And, and basically we structure um, uh, an offer that allows us to uh, bring the consultative approach to see what is the best vehicle for their use and everything about you know, finding the right uh, electric vehicle. The second part is what is the right uh, charging infrastructure, so public charging, but also home charging. Huh? On the opposite of what you were saying, for us, uh, for our customers, home charging is important and the, our ability, for example, to reimburse for the home charging our drivers while the company wants to reimburse uh, for, for the home charging is something that is key and, and we make, we facilitate that for, for our customers. And then some specific uh, focuses like how do we price these electric vehicles, maintenance is completely different, there is uh, you know, much less to maintain on electric vehicle and, and pricing the electric vehicles to reflect you know, what are our ambitions and what is our vision around electric vehicles well, makes for, for this offer that, uh, that we have set up for electric vehicles. Thank you, thank you very much, Andrian. So, so that really shows that there's a depth in the market because there's four distinct, uh, you know, very well laid out customer uh, categories that are pushing for this. Uh, Johan, what, what, what about you? If I could add from our perspective in car sharing, uh, it would, let's talk about the end consumer and, and the let's say the, the uh, appetite to pay more for what's already a sustainable way to use car sharing, but also to make sure that that shared vehicle is electrified or is zero emission. So we really see customers asking for more zero emission vehicles. And when we have tested out this, this clearly shows they're ready to pay for that as well. Uh, and the reality, we have a different kind of operating 
model for that because there are charging cables that get lost. There are a lot of new kind of cost elements and, and, and things that are complicated. But as this matures, as the infrastructure gets better, as the vehicles become more integrated and, and improved in terms of recharging, I think in the longer term, managing an electric fleet in our model station-based car sharing will actually be uh, more sustainable uh, from, from a business performance profitability perspective. And of course, managing a zero emission fleet will further strengthen the, the kind of uh, uh, contribution to, to how we can decarbonize, r r use less resources by sharing them and making sure that they are uh, faster converted to zero emission vehicles. So clearly I see that, uh, that that's a way to, to get buy-in. Uh, it, it clearly shows customers are ready to pay for this. Phenomenal, right now we've talked mostly about the, the, the positives and everything that's moving you know, forward. I know here we've already talked a little bit about the, the challenges as well. Yo Johan, from your perspective, what are the, the things that are making it go not as fast as, as we want? Like what, what are the blockers or, or the, 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 the pitfalls? When we talk about car sharing, we, we want to kind of picture this ideal world where we look at the streets of Paris where there are these shared vehicles and green spaces everywhere. But the reality, when you operate car sharing, in our case, we're in dark underground parking garages trying to direct our customer to the vehicle. That's the reality when you, at scale, want to deliver the service. In dense cities, there is no space for the car. So if we look at all the stations we operate, it's very few, even though in the Nordic region we have massive governmental investments in infrastructure, we're still very far away from overnight turning our fleet electric because we really need the infrastructure in place to, to recharge the vehicle. So I think we really have to think about that uh, there will be challenges in the cities to, to kind of get this infrastructure in place, not just the charging itself and the space required, but all the, all, all the kind of energy that is going to go through this. It's, it's going to be a challenge, I think. So um, I... Again, I will not uh, dwell on hydrogen, but in the longer term, if hydrogen can, can be complementary to battery electric vehicle, we could kind of reduce some of this pressure on having this massive investment in fast charging stations all over the city and create other kind of energy hubs, just like the traditional uh, gas pump could, could become a hub for quickly recharging vehicles, uh, batteries and hydrogen. So I think that's, uh, we, we really see this infrastructure as a main, uh, as a big bottleneck for, for scaling. Um, Andrian, do, do, do you see some, uh, some, some challenges? Same. Sure, so, uh, well, first of all, I would tend to definitely agree uh, with the, this challenge of uh, charging uh, the vehicles in the city. And you have a lot of these uh, homeless cars, if I can call them like this, so uh, they do not have a specific place to park, yet they need to be charged if they're electric. So. Uh, uh, it is a challenge and we see it for drivers in apartment buildings where in most European cities it is a challenge. Um, I wanted to pick up on, on, on the other topic that you were uh, mentioning on the impact this may have on the grid. And in fact, uh, we've been thinking about it a lot and uh, we, we, we believe now that this can be an opportunity rather than a challenge in the sense of, uh, where we believe that the car and more importantly, the battery can play a key role in regulating the energy demand and uh, restitution um, rather than you know, just thinking of everyone plugging the car at 7 p.m. and these big peaks. I think this can be uh, an opportunity where the car becomes uh, a battery on wheels and can restitute part of the energy back to the grid when it needs to when the grid uh, needs to. And in fact, we are investing in, in uh, some projects around vehicle to grid that allow this bi-directional charging that we believe ultimately will, uh, will be a big plus for the uh, uh, energy grids. Uh, and, and we are a little bit more positive on this topic, but for sure, uh, ultimately, I think charging is, 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 uh, is the big challenge. Huh? When we are renting out vehicles in station-based car sharing, on a Saturday afternoon, everything is out. A Saturday evening around 10, all the cars are coming back and they are ready. The customers want to pick them up early on Sunday morning. So this will pose a, a kind of big challenge on the 
consumer behavior on how the fleet, fleets are actually the demand-driven kind of way of how the cars are used. And that's, that's really what we see. We see stations that have a full investment of charging spots, but they're not load balancing, so they cannot handle to charge several cars. They're, they're used to, and, and we need to charge at the station several cars at the same time so that they're ready. And that's really the, uh, the challenges we, we encounter in real life when, when uh, the cars are being used in this, this way. And I would, I would guess this what shows, what confirms what Philip was saying, uh, that how these industries are to a certain extent different uh, in, the, in the expectations and how customers use the, the vehicles. But I think, well, if I look at you uh, and the services that you may provide is exactly this, uh, bringing some intelligence on how the, uh, the charging is operated and uh, how uh, you know, in, uh, intelligent can uh, agreed be uh, in this kind of uh, environment. Huh? Ian, you actually started off in, in, in your first question already showing all the, all the challenges. I think from an uh, enterprise rental car, you know, the, the, the largest car rental company, I think the, you know, I, I saw your presentation earlier. Uh, it's basically, the, you know, some vehicles, they only come back 10 minutes and they're going out again. So obviously the whole charging is very difficult. So I think you, you're probably wishing for these uh, battery packs that you can just re-inject, uh, which is uh, you know, one solution. Now Ian also worked at the TFL, so he has a long history and, and perspective on, uh, on innovation. I've got a very long history in car sharing and car clubs as well. Um, I, I'll just address a couple of points the guys made here. Um, so we operate the largest car club in the United Kingdom, uh, certainly by geographical spread. And it's a back-to-base model. So in the same way as your hands vehicles come back to a charge point, that's exactly how our vehicles operate as well. And Johan sort of mentioned the real estate in cities is hard to come by. So a lot of the contracts in the UK are let by local authorities, city authorities. And they, all those conversations are now about EVs. So not only is it difficult to find the real estate, but it's also where do you get the power from and where do you charge the vehicles? So what we're seeing is a number of combinations. Local authorities want to have EVs, they want to have car club, but the power is the issue. So what we're beginning to see is private public partnerships with third party providers where they are financing the infrastructure where the cities can't afford it. But there have to be a quite a long payback period on that infrastructure, which is usually 10 years or more. Something which local authorities are not typically aligned with on a car club contract. So it's quite interesting how that piece of the piece is moving. Um, the other side of it is that we're also seeing more demand for those charge points because a couple of years ago, it didn't matter if the car club vehicle was sat on the charge point, it wasn't being utilized. But if you think about 10 year payback periods for the charge point, the utilization of the charge point has become almost as important as the utilization of the car club vehicle. So some interesting dynamics around that. Uh, in terms of uh, vehicle to grid by directional charging. We're a little bit more conservative than, than Andrian uh, in that most vehicles today are designed to charge at home. So a benign seven kilowatt AC charge takes its time. As you've already heard, quite a lot of our vehicles are going to be fairly intensive and going to take AC rap DC rapid charging at 100 kilowatts, which puts a lot more stress on the battery. If you bring bi-directional charging in with that sort of environment, that doubles the stress on the battery. And at this moment in time, we're not too sure, we haven't got the figures about what that might do to battery health. And battery health impacts residuals onto the uh, remarketing side of things. So we're just taking a little bit more, maybe conservatively, we're, we're certainly looking into it, we're certainly trialing technologies, um, but you probably won't see bi-directional charging on our fleet in the near future. And then in terms of other, other options going forward, yes, we're seeing a lot of the OEMs develop uh, vehicles with 11 kilowatts uh, AC charging, which doesn't sound much different from seven, but it's almost twice as 50% faster, so that helps. A lot of the vehicles are now coming with 100, 125, 150 kilowatt DC charging, but it again helps from a rental perspective in that our customers can go to a rapid charge station, sit there, have a coffee for 15 minutes, get a couple of hundred kilometers of range and get on their way again. Uh, so that's, that's the really important thing, but the pace of that rollout is, is a key, key issue for us. 
Two years ago, you could go to a rapid charge station in the UK, very rarely you'd have to queue. There weren't many of them. This Christmas, every rapid charge station in the UK had a queue of cars waiting to get onto it. So it just shows you how quickly that's changing. And then just maybe battery swapping. Well, we'll have to look to the OEMs to agree some protocols on that one. I won't get drawn on that. Um, but the other side of it is induction charging. You know, we do see a place for induction in the future. It just simplifies the process, particularly when you've got ISO 15118 plug and play type things where the customer doesn't have to use RFID cards. They don't have to plug anything in. It's just done automatically. So that's kind of some of the, the stepping stones into the future that we see. Thank you, um, Ian. So maybe I think um, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm sure I'm going to get the signal soon. Uh, but maybe a parting uh, words on where you see the uh, industry headed, because we've heard about uh, from this incredible panel opportunities, the current initiatives, the objectives across three different industries in automotive, um, and and uh, and also some of the challenges that we talked through that that are similar and different. Uh, so, uh, parting words on where you see this uh, going forward. I will also kind of end on a positive note with the managed fleet can actually lead the charge for a fast transition into uh, fast decarbonize, but also by a managed and shared fleet, we can give more mobility for, for more users. So in essence, that's what the rental car and a full service leasing company, and as we are similar in that way, we operate similar models. That's what we can achieve, and, and that can really be positive to, to uh, both uh, creating good mobility and, and decarbonize the, the transportation system. Okay. Very quickly, I think that uh, I would just say that it seems now obvious that electric mobility is the only way uh, that would allow us to reach the uh, zero emission targets, be it hydrogen, which indeed is an electric vehicle as well, or fully battery electric vehicles. And I think that our role as an industry is to help customers you know, move as smooth as possible into something that can look quite hectic. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that future is electric. Well, I've got to agree with both of my panelists here. Uh, we are in a transition stage. I think if we think back at this conference in 2030, you think, what was all the fuss about? Maybe charging a vehicle would not be so different from what we experience today with a nice vehicle, just because of battery technologies, powertrain, and things like that. But you have to remember that EVs are not the answer to all mobility issues. But I think shared mobility is certainly the way forward and, and enterprises company, we're going to help our customers transition to meet net zero objectives. We are going to invest billions of euros and dollars into this process over the next few years, perhaps more than most governments. So we are a key part of this transition and helping our customers going forward. Thank, thank you, Johan. Uh... Uh, Andrian and, and Ian for this uh, great panel session. I think uh, we ran out of time, unfortunately, so we'll take questions uh, after. So, but we're uh, obviously available. And uh, onwards to net zero with uh, three automotive industries uh, well represented here. Thank you so much. Thank you.